The following is a new seven black history special, Black Slaves, Red Masters. Hello everyone, I'm Sam Ford. Earlier this month in our seven inside reports, I took a personal journey to look at a largely unknown chapter of black history when my ancestors and thousands of other blacks were slaves, not of the whites, but of the Indians. Well, a lot of people responded who'd missed some of the segments and who wanted to know more about the subject. So today you'll see it all and more and get your pencils. At the end, we'll have not a test, but an address and phone number where you can get more information. Every summer at Tahlequah, Oklahoma, the Cherokee Indians sponsor their Trail of Tears pageant, the story of how the U.S. government robbed the so-called five civilized tribes of their homelands in the South and moved them by force to Oklahoma. They don't tell about the thousands of blacks the tribes brought with them, their slaves. My mammy and pappy belong to a part Cherokee named W.P. Thompson when I was born. The woman reading is my sister, Elaine Ford Staten, but the words are those of our great-grandmother, Phyllis Thompson Pettit, whose Georgia-born parents were brought by the Cherokees over the trail. Johnson Thompson was Phyllis's brother. Before that, Pappy had been owned by three different masters. One was the rich Joe Van, who lived down at Weber's Fall, and another was Chief Lowry of the Cherokees. My cousin, Maurice Shepard, reading the words of his great-grandfather. The interviews were conducted 52 years ago here at Fort Gibson, Oklahoma, when both my great-grandmother Phyllis Pettit and her brother Johnson Thompson were in their 80s, part of a federal writer's project. Now, both of them are buried in this cemetery. But after I read their words, I was set on a mission to find out how my family became slaves of the Indians. I learned that beginning with the administration of George Washington, it was the policy of the U.S. government to civilize the Indians by teaching them modern farming techniques. To adopt agricultural practices that uh, patterned uh, after the whites, and one of those in the South was slave trade. I don't ever talk about it very much because I think it's a very shameful part of, um, of Cherokee history, and so I've purposely avoided involving myself in that, um, in that whole issue. While the current chief may be ashamed, at the Cherokee Museum today are slave bills of sale, including one for three slaves bought in 1841 by then-principal chief John Ross. The chief and his brother Lewis were among the biggest slaveholders in the tribe. Indeed, many of my mother, Kathleen's ancestors, the Rosses, were owned by the chief's family. They were Southerners. They uh, adopted Southern institutions, Southern dress southern uh, black slavery. But one characteristic they did not like was southern greed for their land. By 1830, through wars and treaties, the five tribes had lost most of it. Then they were all ordered to move west to Oklahoma. Four of the tribes left, but the Cherokees took their case to the U.S. Supreme Court and won. At least they won the lawsuit. Then the man on the $20 bill stepped in. And President uh, Jackson essentially told the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court, uh, uh, you know, you made your ruling in favor of the Cherokees, now, you know, try to enforce it. As president, Andrew Jackson controlled the army, so 14,000 Cherokees and 1,600 slaves were herded to Oklahoma, some groups in winter, with about a quarter of the Indians and blacks dying along the way. You got plenty of Indians right today don't like Andrew Jackson in this area. 84-year-old Luther Scales, who describes himself as one-quarter black and three-quarters Indian, is president of the Coweta, Oklahoma Historical Society. He remembers stories his Creek Indian grandfather told him about the removal, which was devastating for the Creeks as well. He said the, 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 the roughest part of it was crossing the Mississippi River in a boat. How so? Well, man, the Mississippi River, do you know, down there in, uh, in Arkansas and in, in Mississippi, when you, and you're talking about a mile across, a mile, a mile or so across the river. And in, 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 in a boat, as swift as that water running, well, you got problems. Once in Oklahoma, the slaves were put to work, raising cotton, building the new nations. The Merrill home, which still stands outside Tahlequah, Oklahoma, was built by the Cherokees' black slaves. And should you think the Indians were much kinder masters than the whites, listen to Granny Phyllis's words in the interview about my great-grandfather. My husband was George Pettit. 
He tell me his mammy was sold away from him when he was a little boy. He looked down a long lane after her just as long as he could see her and cried after her. He went down to the big road and sat down by his mammy's barefoot tracks in the sand and sat there until it got dark. And then he come on back to the quarters. Oklahomans reenacting the Civil War Battle of Honey Springs. When it actually occurred, this was the Creek Nation in Indian Territory, slave territory, in which all of the five civilized tribes had signed treaties supporting the South. And the battle actually looked much like something out of the movie Glory, except it wasn't the 54th Massachusetts, but the first Kansas Colored Regiment that saved the day. Because of fear of attacks from nearby Kansas, many Indian slave owners fled south. I can just remember when Master John Harnish took us to Texas. We went in a covered wagon with oxen and camped out all along the way. My sister, Elaine Ford Staten, reading the words of our great-grandmother, Phyllis Pettit, a girl at the time of the war. In ex-slave interviews conducted by federal workers during the Depression, she told how her brother, Johnson Thompson, and her parents were sold from one Cherokee master to another and taken to Texas. And Pappy done the driving of the oxen. I was set in a wagon and listened to him pop his whip and holler. On the square of the old Cherokee capital in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, stands a monument to Cherokee Confederate war dead. But the war here was confusing. While Cherokee chief John Ross was arrested by the Union Army and shipped to D.C., his mansion was burned to the ground by Cherokee Confederate General Stan Wadey, who just didn't like the chief. And while Creek Chief Samuel Chicote fought for the South, Apothelea Hola, another Creek chief, fought for the unions, his slaves at his side. In any event, when the war was over, the tribes who'd all signed Confederate treaties were in trouble. The United States government informed the five civilized tribes that all previous treaties are null and void. And the first thing to be accomplished is to sign a peace treaty. The new treaties meant the Indians lost more land. And since this wasn't legally considered the United States, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had not covered Indian slaves, so the treaty said they had to be freed. One of the things the federal government required in those treaties was that, that these tribes adopt the blacks as equal members of the tribe, their former slaves. One day, old master stayed after he ate breakfast, and when us Negroes come in to eat, he said, after today, I ain't your master anymore. You all as free as I am. We just stand and look and don't know what to say about it. The words of her brother, Johnson Thompson, read by his great-grandson, Maurice Shepard. Pappy wanted to go back to his mother when the war was over and the slaves were freed. He made a deal with Dave Mounts, a white man who was moving into the Indian country to drive for him. Granny Phyllis described a harrowing trip in which they had to fight off wolves with fire from their camp, a wagon journey over land and water that lasted five weeks. When we would come to a river, we would cross ferry boats, but me and brother rode on a bed in the back of the wagon, and when we were crossing a river, father would make us lie down and wouldn't let us look out. He was afraid we would fall out in the river. Finally, they arrived back to Fort Gibson in northeastern Oklahoma, where their father's mother was working as a cook for the U.S. soldiers. My grandma, Phyllis Harnish, was the mother of the Colored Baptist Church on Four Mile Branch, east of Fort Gibson. She organized the church and was head of it as long as she lived. Since the Cherokee tribe owned all the land, as new Cherokee citizens, the family merely picked a spot. After Granny Phyllis Pettit married, her first child was my grandmother, Lutetia, whose third child was my dad, Sammy. Pettits and Fords still own this land today. Our Black History Special will continue in just a moment with more about black slaves, Red Masters. <laughs>